By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against Frank from the Netherlands and he's playing a black and a green deck to the table that I've called Bog Dwellers because there are a lot of bogs in here, like seriously. <laughs> it's, it's quite a cool deck. Uh, I'm playing with one of my favorite decks as well, Orbitron, which is a white and a red Tron deck. I haven't played with it in a while, really looking forward uh, to play with it again, especially against Frank, who always brings original decks to the table. So really looking forward to this matchup. Now, before I jump into the deck tech, I just want to point out that if you want to skip that, you can check the description below. There you will, you will find several timestamps. One of those stamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. And here we are going to continue with the deck tech. I'm going to start with my own deck, Orbitron. Let's take a look. And here we see my deck, the Orbitron deck. Now, this is a uh, deck that combines a few strategies. Maybe the first thing to point out is the Parfait strategy. If you're not familiar with that, in Old School Magic, there are two artifacts that you can tap and then they shut off. It's super unique. It's very interesting. It's Howling Mine and it's Winter Orb. So if you tap Winter Orb, it doesn't work. Tap Howling Mine, it doesn't work. So that's why I'm also playing with Relic Barriers. Relic Barriers, card from Legends, two to cast, and you can tap Relic Barrier to tap down target artifact, right? So that works really well. With the Relic Barrier, I can tap down my Howling Mine or my Winter Orb and shut them off. Now that is called Parfait, that kind of mechanic. That's what they call Parfait in Old School Magic. Now I'm also playing with two Icy Manipulators. They can basically do the same thing for me as my Relic Barrier. Now Howling Mine, of course, we all know, allows you to draw an extra card, right? But it also allows your opponent to draw an extra card. So you want to draw extra, but you don't want your opponent to draw extra. That's actually not a problem because you can tap it down using your Relic Barrier. So I go to my draw step, I draw two cards, and then in my upkeep, uh, or sorry, in my main phase, I tap down my um, Howling Mine, and then my opponent only gets to draw one card. Now this same strategy works for Winter Orb. Winter Orb Artifact for two, that says during your untap step, you can only untap one land. So instead of just all the lands, only one land. Super annoying, super annoying card. But what can you do with this Parfait strategy? You can say at the end of turn of your opponent, I can tap down my Winter Orb. That means Winter Orb doesn't work for me anymore. I untap everything, all my lands and my Winter Orb. And then, hey, Winter Orb is active again. And that means that my opponent only gets to untap one land. So that is super annoying. Um, when I've got Parfait online, it's kind of like a soft prison, right? My opponent can still do something, but not as much. I'm drawing more cards than my opponent. He's only uh, able to untap one land. I'm able to untap all my lands. So I have so much advantage. I can basically take over the game. Now, another added advantage of that is Winter Orb and Icy Manipulator. Remember what I said. With Winter Orb, my opponent can only untap one land. Now, with Icy... I can tap that land again. So he goes to untap, he untaps one land. In response, I use my Icy, I tap down that land again. And he's got nowhere to go, you know. And another good thing about Icy, I can also tap down his mana rocks, but I can also use the Relic Barrier for that. So Relic Barrier and Icy Manipulator really go well. They go hand in hand with Winter Orb. So that's kind of the strategy to get my opponent in a soft lock. Now, another part of this deck is, of course, the Tron part of the deck. So you've got Urtz's uh, Tower, Urtz's Mine, Urtz's Power Plant. Now, when you've got all the three of these lands in the game, something magical happens. All of a sudden, they don't tap for one mana. No, Urtz's Mine and Urtz's Power Plant, they tap for two mana, and Urtz's Tower taps for three mana. In other words, I'm going to have a lot of lands. Now, the difficult thing in old school is there are not a lot of cards that let you tutor for stuff, right? You really have to wait until you draw into something. That's very old school. That's the way magic used to work. So um, what I do is I'm playing with my Howling Mind, so I simply get to draw more cards. If I draw more cards, I have a bigger chance of simply drawing into my Tron combination. When my Tron is online, I can play out more cards quicker, right? Maybe I can play out two Suchis in a single turn. Maybe I can play out, what, two Trites in a single turn. But being able to play out more cards also means that I'm going to run out of gas very quickly. And this is, again, where the Howling Mines have an important job to do. They're going to make sure that my hand is nicely filled. Now, one of my favorite cards, maybe my favorite card, is actually in this deck. And that is the Argivian Archaeologist, a.k.a. The Shirt. 
I think it's uh, such a cool card. It just has something goofy and it's also a really good card. Uh, the problem is it is a 1-1 one -one and you need a lot of white. So what Argivian archaeologists can do, right, for, uh, for double white and one, you can tap it and it can bring back an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. Now, that is something fantastic, right? And now imagine that you have a Chaos Orb on the battlefield and you have Argivian archaeologists. I can activate my Chaos Orb I can destroy something and then I can use my archaeologist to get it back into my hand. Now, I have to be honest with you, this does happen from time to time, but what happens way, 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 way more than that is I play archaeologist, archaeologist gets killed. But hey, if that happens, at least it eats up some removal, so it's not too bad. Uh, what I have noticed is that it's pretty obvious, but still you can, you can keep that in the back of your mind, is that when you play archaeologist late game, there's a bigger chance that it actually will stay alive longer because your opponent will maybe already have gone through, um, you know, his removal spells, you know, so that always works. Another thing that you can do is you can say, you know what, I'm just going to play it early game. He's probably going to destroy it. But like I said before, at least it eats uh, one of his removal spells. Okay, so um, this is my deck, Orbitron. I kind of told you really quickly how it works. Obviously, there's a Disintegrate and a Fireball in there because if you've got tons of mana, right? Why not play with those two burn spells to kind of finish your opponent off as well? So this is my deck. Now let's take a look at the deck of Frank. And here we see the deck of my opponent, Frank Bog Dwellers. And I really, really like this deck. So first off, maybe it's good to just read the dictionary definition of bog, right? So a bog here, here it goes. An area of wet, muddy ground that is too soft to support a heavy body. So... I like that. I like that. I like that idea that you kind of get drawn into the bog and it looks like it's all good. And then when you're in there, you're kind of sucking down. It doesn't support your body and you like slowly die right in the bog. I think the bog is something really like evil. Right. And also a card like Marsh Gas, card from the dark, by the way, minus two minus O to all the creatures that's in this deck. That, that is just really fitting. I just think this deck uh, Flavor-wise, is it's just beautiful. I mean, you've got Bog Imp, Bog Rats, you've got um, uh, Bog Wrath. So you've got all the box. Then you've got Will o the Wisp, which I think fits in perfectly with the theme. If you look at the art, it's in a bog, right? So it, it, it all makes sense. The color combination, green and black, that creates a bog. It, it just, it's, it's perfect. It's really, really well done. And then here you see three um, bad moons. Well, when there's a full moon, all the bad creatures come out, right? There's always the scary Terra Knight. So Terra is actually in here as well. Evil Presence is in here. You know, Evil Presence works great with Bok Raph, but also flavor-wise, it's a great inclusion. The fog really fits that whole bog, foggy area that all these creatures are in. It just, it all makes sense, you know? Everything connects. I think Dark Heart of the Wood is also really, really interesting. Uh, and really fitting in this deck as well. Now, if we look at what my opponent wants to do, it's kind of like a little bit like an aggro deck, isn't it? Like a weenie aggro deck, right? He wants to play Will of the Wisp, Bok Rats, one of those two turn one. He wants to get into a Bat Moon as fast as he can in turn two, maybe turn three. Then he can also play Bog Imp. Bog Imp, of course, it's a pretty bad card, right? It's one black and one for one one. But hey, it does have flying and that is some evasion especially against the deck that he's playing um, against today. I have no flyers in my deck. I have other ways to deal with creatures, but I don't have any flyers. So that could actually work in the advantage of Frank. I think what's going to be hard for him is he has to deal with my horrible Triskelions. My Triskelions can really hurt Frank's deck here unless he can just get those Bat Moons out early. I think if he can get Bat Moons out early, put full pressure on early, he definitely has a chance. I think, of course, those... Um, Crumbles are really, really good. He's probably going to board in another crumble after uh, after the first match, uh, the first game, I should say. So that's going to work. Really, really nice deck. Really liking the flavor here. Oh, and I think those glooms in the sideboard, by the way, ooh, they're going to be they're going to be pretty tough for me actually. So uh, this is the deck of Frank. We've already looked at my deck. Let's go to the action. Let's go to game one. Game number one, my opponent Frank is on the start with that beautiful Dan Frazier playmat. And there is a Will of the Wisp turn one. There is an Ursus Tower and okay, there's a Mox Pearl tapping two. 
and there's a relic barrier in passing turn. Pretty good opening for me. Usually my deck is pretty slow. Let's see what my opponent can do. Oh, look at that beautiful black border bayou. Absolutely stunning. And look at all the art on the playmat, by the way. I see a bat or blood moon, a time wa a walk there, a black lotus art, all sorts of different types of art there. Uh, talking about moons, there is the bad moon as well for Frank, which is a great start. So he's able to deal some damage here. Going to 19, and I'm just passing turn. Cannot find a Howling Mine. That would have been ideal here. Finding another forest. Attacking me again. I'm going to drop to 18. Black Lotus. Cracking the Lotus. There's a Bokrath and a Bokrats. Wow, this is a lot of pressure. Remember, the Bat Moon is giving plus one, plus one to all the black creatures. So I'm in for... Wow. Four, six, seven damage. Finding a Swords at least to take care of the Bokrath, but still taking in three damage. Another Willow. I really need to start playing out some cards here. But I'm just passing turn, not finding any land anymore or any other things that can help me out here. Taking four damage, going to 11. Things are looking quite well for Frank. Another Relic Barrier, not what I want to see. Taking more damage, another Willow. I'm on six at the moment. Next turn, he can actually hit me for five. I have to pass again. This is going to be a very quick game. Okay, there's at least the Swords going on two. And playing an evil presence, that means... Oh man, showing my hand. That's it, it's already over. <laughs> over before we start it. Well done. So game one goes, um, goes to Frank here. Game number two, and here we go. So wow, that game one went fast. Let's hope that uh, I can make it more into an actual match here in game number two. There's again my Mox Pearl, but there's an answer, a crumble from Frank. Pearl is gone. Tower remains though. And there's the second part of the puzzle, the power plant. All I need now is a mine to get Tron going. And maybe then I can make a fist against all these little creatures. There's the first one, Bok Rats. Let's see what I can do here. Playing a City of Brass, tapping two, and I'm playing a Chaos Orb. So that's something. And beautiful Bayou again. It looks like he wanted to tap three down. He's going to attack first. Put me on 19, going to play an Untamed Wilds, a card I really like and I think is a little bit underplayed. So it allows you to look up any basic land of your choice and that comes into play untapped. So basically, Untamed Wilds casting cost is one green and two, but you get one back immediately. And then I'm going to flip end of turn on the Bayou. Interesting choice here to flip on the Bayou. I could have also waited until he maybe played out uh, another card. Here, there's another Bayou. I think I think it wasn't really my best decision to flip on the Bayou because, for example, if he hits four mana and he plays a Bokrath, I can still like flip on the Bokrath. So, yeah, I think it would have been better to just uh, let him have the Bayou. Anyway, decision has been made. Another attack by the Bokrats. At least he's not finding a lot of creatures this time. And that gives me some time. I'm playing a Soul Ring, tapping four here, go to 15, and I'm playing a Suchi. And there is a crumble again. Oh, so many crumbles. At least I'm going to go up to 19. And as long as he's only able to just deal one damage, it's not that bad. There's a bog in the 1-1 one, one flyer from the dark. Hey, Earth's is mine. I've got Tron. And that means seven mana. Will we see a Triskelion here? Eight mana. Ooh, two icy manipulators. And I think I've got how many cards? It looks like he's still got quite a few cards in hand. Frank only having one card left now, drawing into his second one. This is a good draw, though, playing a bad moon. I can tap down two of his creatures. He's going to attack him with the Willow. I'm going to drop to 16. And as long as he can keep dealing damage, there's still a chance that he's going to win this one. Another tower. So I've got a lot of mana on my hands now. And there is a disenchant on the bad moon. And that really helps. That means at least I'm not taking any damage. And hopefully I can just draw into, for example, a trike and uh, kill some of his little creatures and start attacking. Let's see what I can find. I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of mana, but now I need to find a follow-up. 
this is actually where you would like to draw into, for example, a Howling Mind, because that can really help you just keep drawing cards and keep playing out powerful spells. It's just not happening here. There is a Bokrath. And if Frank can now simply cast an Evil Presence, then he's taking away my Tron, and he's got an unblockable Bokrath. Of course I can tap it down with the Icy, but still, it would be a pretty good play. Playing a Regrowth, getting back the Bad Moon. Ooh, this is bad news for me. And taking a damage, and there's a Disenchant again, and I'm tapping down two of his creatures, taking a damage from the Bokrath Rats, going to 13. And, oh, another Bad Moon. More bad news. And it goes really quickly, but I played um, I played a Swords to Plowsiers on his Bokrath in response to the Bad Moon, taking a damage from the Willow attack. I'm on 11. I've got so much mana, but if I'm not drawing into anything, what can I do? Casting a Disintegrate, ah, that is not what you want to do. Casting a Disintegrate for two on his Willow to Wisp. But of course, I need to think in terms of wanting to survive another Bat Moon. So that means those creatures are 3-3. Three, three. Luckily for me, I've got those Icy Manipulators keeping me alive. Without the Icy, I would have been dead a long time ago. Taking damage again, playing Wheel of Fortune. Oh, and I'm showing my... Archaeologist, and this is the annoying thing about Archaeologist. Why is it too white to cast? Why? It wouldn't be too strong if you would just give it one white and two to cast, for example. Anyway, it is what it is, right? Um, so dr using my Wheel of Fortune and uh, finding my Library of Alexandria, so that's really nice. But there's also um, another crumble, this time on one of my Ices. So it's going to bring me up to 13, but that's not so nice because now we can start attacking. Ooh, evil presence. Oh, man, that is painful. That is painful. Well done, Frank. Evil presence on my Library of Alexandria. Oh, man. And he's going to hit me for three, because remember, there are two bat moons, so that Bokrats is now a 3-3. Three, three. So, again, it's looking very bad for me. Oh, man. What have I drawn into? It must be something useful there, right? A Suchi, it's okay, but it's not great. At least it allows me to block the Bok Rats, which is now a 3-3, so I can tap down the Bog Imp and I don't take any damage, I guess. So, I mean, let's hope that that kind of is the scenario. I mean, I'm still on 10. Let's see what I can do. Playing a Plateau there. At least then I have double white, but my archaeologist is already in the bin. There is a maze of if. I mean, it's going to be really difficult to kill Frank, by the way, because he's got Dark Heart of the Wood. He's got a maze of if. I mean, it's not looking great for me. And there is another uh, Bog Imp. And it's a 3 3 flyer. And look at that. I'm actually killing my own creature, going to 14. Does that mean I have a balance? I mean, balance could get me back into this. And, oh, look at that. Okay, playing a City of Brass. And then I'm playing a balance. Wow. That is very interesting. And now we're counting the amount of cards. I've got eight lands. He's got more lands than me. He's probably going to sack them to his Dark Heart of the Wood right in response. So he's going to just get tons and tons of life. He's going to lose his creatures and lose some cards in hand. This is pretty interesting, actually. Frank is already on 23, and I mean, he's going to go all the way up. I'm using a little dice there. I'm not quite sure what his life total is, but with Dark Heart of the Wood, you gain three life when you sacrifice a forest. So I'm, I'm sure he's on, I don't know, 40 or something. A lot of life. Oh, and a Bok Rats. Okay, at least I can tap that one down. It's not ideal. Okay, there is a Winter Orb. Passing turn. And, uh, yeah, tapping down his Bok Rats, of course. I've got so much, so much land, but nothing to do with it. Only one card in hand. 
Passing turn here. It has been a very interesting game. Okay, I guess I'm not passing turn. I'm playing a Suchi out instead. Maybe that will allow me to at least put some pressure, although my opponent now has a Will-O-The-Wisp as well. And every time I think that I can finally deal some damage, he comes up with an answer. And I'm passing turn here. Of course, tapping down the Willow because it has flying. And it looks like we're kind of stuck here, but I do think that uh, Frank definitely has the advantage exactly because basically what he wants to do is just play out more cards. Okay, there are some uh, full arts Tron lands that uh, <laughs> I think Martin, he's in the room as well, showed to me. They're pretty stunning, by the way. I believe they're Chronicle Edition. There is another Suchi. So that's good for me. At least I can block now both of the Bokrats. And I just need to keep tapping down the Willow. So he wants to go into attack, right? And now I've got to tap another land, which is kind of annoying. Because I can only untap one with the Winter Orb. And playing another tower. And I'm going to destroy his maze. Does that mean I'm going to double attack? I'm going to attack with one. Interesting. He can just double block, right? He's actually not double blocking. I believe there's 14 on the hint is D20. That means he's on 34. Ooh, there's a Chaos Orb. Disenchant upon activation. Okay, it's good that I still had the Disenchant. Probably kept it in hand. So it was good that I didn't decide to kill one of his bad moons. Now I'm attacking and there's the double block. Then, ooh, there's a Swords. Before damage is dealt, Swordsing the Bok Rats. That means it's going to gain three life, but the double block isn't going to work anymore. Oh, and he's playing a Fox, so that means the Bok Rats will stay alive. Good move here by Frank. Nice to see this. I'm, I'm a big fan of combat. There's another Willow. That's a problem because I don't have any Flyers. And that Willow is a 2-3. Ooh, another Icy. I'm so incredibly lucky to find another Icy Manipulator here. And there is an evil presence on the plateau. I actually believe in the deck photo there were only two Icy Manipulators, by the way, in Orbitron. But I've made a few changes since. And I believe I play with three now. And playing out another City of Brass. Another evil presence. Of course, I've, I have to tap down the Willows. And now I can at least attack with one Suchi, right? We're playing pretty quickly. I think I should attack. I'm not attacking with the Suchi? Why am I not attacking with the Suchi? I don't understand. Maybe I'm missing something here, but... Okay, now I'm attacking with two? Yeah, why not? And he's taking eight damage. So I'm probably going to play out another creature, right? I'm not. Do I have... Okay, I've got a Swords. It would have made more sense, by the way, to Swords a Willow and to tap down a Bokrat. So I think I'm making a mistake here. Not sure if it has a big influence, but still. Okay, there's a Trike. I think he's on 24 and another another evil presence. Those evil presences actually are doing some work. And yeah, exactly. So my trike is still a 4-4. Four, four. Three plus one plus one counters. Playing out a howling mine and a relic barrier. Attacking with everything I have. He's playing a marsh gas. That means minus two minus oh on all my creatures. So he takes 6 damage. He's finally under 20 for the first time in this game too. He's on 18. And playing Untamed Wilds. Wow, and what an interesting game this is. Now remember, he still has the Dark Heart of the Wood, right? He can sacrifice a Bayou or a Forest for 3 life. Also, when we look at his uh, library, he's about to get decked as well. So it's interesting because I've got the Howling Mind, so I'm going to draw more cards. But maybe I should allow him to draw as well. And, of course, i got to really be careful about what to untap and whatnot because of that Winter Orb. 
Attacking with everything I have, dealing 12 more damage. He's on six. Okay, playing another trike. That's it. That's game. Okay. Oh, ho, ho, what a game number two. I really thought that Frank was going to get this one again. Oh, man. Okay, so it's 1-1. One, one. Oh, phew. And uh, yeah, wow. I have to say, Frank, um, your deck, it's working pretty good. So now we're going to the third and the size of game. Who's going to win this one? Frank, who's really, really quick, or me, who's kind of slow, but when I have control, I can go up and over. So let's see, game three, the decider. Okay, 1-1, one, one, Frank on the play. Look at his start here. Turn one, Bokrats, instant pressure, just uh, an Urtz's mine from my part. And there's an attack going to 19. At least not a bad moon, that's something, and not a Bog Imp, so it's not the worst. Ooh, this is good, Mishra's Workshop. Oh, that is great. Remember, I can tap it for three mana, finding a Suchi, but there is a Crumble. At least that's going to give me some life, you know, that's something. And life is going to buy me time. So I'm on 23 now, gaining four life for the Suchi. Going to go to 22. And again, he's using his Untamed Wilds to finding a land. And now I've got five mana, but nothing to do with it. Remember, on six, I can start playing out a Trike. And there is a Bokrath. I'm on 21. Finding another Urtz's Mine and casting a Trike here. Wow, that is pretty good news. So it's a 4 4 Trike. And this is enough to kind of stop my opponent from attacking, having that 3 3 and that 1 1. There is a City of Brass. And let's see what I can do. Can I find something here? A little bit stuck in the tank, it seems. I guess the good sign of that is that I have a lot of options. I've got a lot of mana as well, of course. And remember, the Mishra's Workshop, you can only tap. Ooh, there's a Fireball, and then I'm attacking. So that was what I was thinking about. He's actually chum blocking with the rats, not taking any damage. What I wanted to say is the Mishra's Workshop is phenomenal, but you can only use the mana to cast artifacts, right? So I cannot use it for Fireball or anything else. And passing turn, interesting here. There is a Bokrath untapping. So this time I'm putting some pressure on my opponent, Frank, here, who's dropping to 12. And this is great for him, a blocker. He's attacking. I'm going down to 12, but there is a Swords to Plows here. So that's kind of ideal for that Willow. Attacking, he's going to go to 8. And, ooh, there's another Willow to block. And I'm dropping to 14. Do I have another Swords or maybe an Icy Manipulator to tap down? There is a Suchi. Now I'm thinking, because I can ping him for one, then he has to uh, regenerate the Willow, and then the Willow gets tapped. So that's something I can do next turn. Ooh, there is Chaos Orb. Is he going to flip the Chaos Orb? That is the big question. And then the thing is with Chaos Orb, you activate it and you don't have to choose a target yet. Then it's up to your opponent to respond. If your opponent doesn't respond, um, you know, then you cannot, um, then he has to flip, you know. And the reason I'm saying this is when Frank says I'm going to activate it, I have to choose if I want to use the counters on the trike. Okay, it's not relevant here because I cast a disenchant, but it's interesting to know, you know, because I don't have the information if he's going to, flip on the trike or not. Anyway, I'm going to attack. There is a fog. Pretty well done. That means he can hit me for three if he wants, but he's very low on life, so he's not very likely to do that unless he has another fog in hand. He's on eight, playing out his last card, which is a forest. And things are looking bad. I think I can actually win it. I wonder if I realize that I can win it because what I can do is I can ping the Will-O-The-Wisp. He's actually going to attack. Interesting. He's going to put me on 11. Why is he attacking? Does he have more cards in hand that we can't see perhaps? Let's see what I'm going to do. And playing an Archaeologist. Playing a Chaos Orb. And this is interesting. And I'm going to flip here on the Willow. I think I'm actually missing. Oh, that's so bad. 
I don't know what it was doing with my hands. I don't I don't think it was ever okay. Finally, look, Frank is a nice guy. He's he's telling me like, dude, you can just ping it for one, and I have to regenerate, and it taps. Okay, <laughs> save me out of my misery, and then of course I can uh, uh, swing in for seven. He's on one right, but then he can remove the final two counters from the trike. So. Yeah, really sorry, Frank, for uh, for the way this game this game ended. It took a while for me to realize that I can just, of course, ping the willow, and then you've got to regenerate and tap it. So, anyway, uh, it was really really interesting to play against your Bog Dwellers deck, a really beautiful deck, and I'm I'm surprised how well it actually worked. You know, um, that is pretty good. Also happy and always fun to play with my Orbitron deck uh, again, and always good to practice these more mid-range decks against these kind of quicker decks to see like, okay, does it have enough removal? Is there enough balance? Um, you know, and yeah, I, I, I think I think there's still some tweaking work to do with the Arbitron deck, but overall I'm not unhappy with, with how the deck is performing. Anyway, this was the match, the episode of this week. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about both of our decks. It's always um, welcome and interesting for me to read your feedback. I also would like to thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks. You're really supporting the channel just by simply watching the episodes, enjoying the content. If you want to uh, help the channel out, by the way, what you can do is you can leave a like. You can also subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet. Something else that you can do is you can become a sponsor, a patron of the channel. Now, how can you do that? That's actually quite simple. There's probably your card popping up right now. Click on that card that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And there you can become a patron. It starts already with $1 a month. And we've got a lot of cool stuff happening when you join Timmy Talks on Patreon, including a special Timmy Discord. Um, talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at all the amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ich bin ein Schwingertes Sommerkazin.